Okay, we're ready to, Fred, you can start recording. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Bert Dicht. I am Vice President of Membership for the National Space Society. And on behalf of Larry Ahern, Vice President of Chapters, I'd like to welcome you to our NSS Space Forum, a conversation with Scott Pace. Again, we thank you for joining us in this series of virtual space forums and town halls. It's hard to believe we've been doing this now for a year and we've had some great, great speakers and we're looking for another great session this evening. What I wanna do now is just remind you of the virtual etiquette uh, as you go through and listen to, to tonight's presentation to submit a question. It's best to use the Q&A function because that's only seen by the panelists and it goes right to them. So you won't have any issues with that. And sometimes when you put a question into the chat, it can be lost with all the other information that's presented in the chat. So use the Q&A function for your questions, use the chat for comments, and we use that sometimes to post other information as well. I will ask that you be respectful of all the panelists and the audience because they can see everything that's in the chat. Finally, it's best for you to go into a speaker mode when you, when you actually view it. That way, the person who's speaking is highlighted and you'll be able to see that. So our agenda, I like typically, I've got a few NSS announcements that we always do. I'll talk about what's coming up next and then we'll get right into our presentation and Q&A and then we'll close out the session for this evening. So we always do our NSS announcements and just like to remind you of some links and we can post these in the chat, but check out our NSS website at space.nss.org. And also all the members go to insidenss.org for our membership portal. You have to be a member to get access to that, but it has a lot of great information and a way for you to actually take control of your membership. Our YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter sites, we're getting more active there. So please check those out as well. And of course, if you are very supportive of what we do, we already know you are, and you're enjoying the program like this, I encourage you to make a donation to support uh, NSS at go.nss.org slash donate dot dash now. And I will post that into the chat. And we do appreciate all the people who've made contributions uh, during these sessions. It really helps us out. Also at the end, we have a very, very short survey to complete. It's anonymous. So just take a few minutes and give us your feedback on tonight's session. We really appreciate it. And it's very helpful for planning future events. And I just wanna remind you about what's coming up next. We've got a great session in two weeks from tonight. Uh, new perspectives on, on filling the gaps in space law to support future communities in space. So Michelle Hanlon, our NSS president, uh, is bringing in a great panel of law students and they're gonna be talking about those issues. So I invite you to, to join us for that. And then just two weeks after that, we have another group of young professionals, an early career aerospace professionals panel, and that's gonna be mo uh, moderated by Chantel Beyer, one of our board members. Uh, on the 20th, uh, dual space access architecture enables dreams of many with Peter Swan. That's about space elevators. Now tentative, we were looking at June 3rd for our NSS awards. I don't know if it's gonna stay that date, but in June, we'll have a preview of the Virtual International Space Development Conference, and then we'll go to our virtual ISDC uh, and June 24th to 27th. So look for more announcements there and check out our website on all the space forums that'll be coming up. We'll be working now on all of the activities that will happen uh, in, Ju in July and August. So we hope to have a great, great uh, lineup for you. So now it is uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce our, our moderator tonight, and then he will introduce our, our guest speaker. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague, NSS colleague, Greg Autry. Greg is the uh, NSS Vice President of Space Development and also a member of the NSS Board of Directors. And he's currently Clinical Professor of Space Leadership and Policy and Business 
at the Thunderbird School of Global Management at Arizona State University. So it's my pleasure to turn everything over to Greg. And Greg, it is all yours. I'm gonna stop sharing right now. Well, thank you, Bert. Uh, thank you, Fred, and everybody that helped put together this, uh, this fantastic event. And thanks mostly to our guest, Scott. I am uh, incredibly honored to uh, have the opportunity to uh, spend an hour with him and, uh, and share his insights. Uh, Scott is somebody I was very pleased to have the opportunity to work directly with and uh, occasionally indirectly over the, the last four years, uh, helping uh, in a very, very small part to contribute to the, uh, the great work that he did uh, in essentially uh, reestablishing American space policy uh, and setting a brilliantly coherent direction that uh, I'm proud to uh, see is being carried forward in general uh, by the new administration. If you don't know, uh, Scott is the director of the Space Policy Institute and professor of practice of international affairs at George Washington University's Elliott School of International Affairs. Uh, and he's a member of the uh, School of Public Policy and Public Administration there. Um, what probably interests us tonight is that he's a longtime uh, space community advocate, uh, a founding uh, member almost of NSS, going back to the L5 Society, and of course, served as the executive secretary of the National Space Council, which was reconstituted under Vice President Pence uh, when the Trump administration came in in 2017. Uh, I'm excited to say that as a member of the NASA agency review team, that was one of our strong recommendations to the vice president. And uh, I don't think anybody has ever stepped up as much for space as, as Vice President Pence did uh, and inconsistently. Um, Scott uh, was obviously the, the perfect pick for that, uh, that job and the series of uh, space policy directives that, that he and his staff helped craft uh, together with the uh, President and Vice President, uh, as I noted, have been uh, simply seminal. So uh, with no further ado, um, I, I'd like to introduce Scott. And Scott, if we could, can we kind of go back to the beginning about what got you interested in space? I know that as a young person in high school, I was inspired by uh, Gerard O'Neill's book, The High Frontier. And when the L5 Society began to work against the, the Moon Treaty, which was a, a misconceived uh, uh, international agreement uh, following on to the Outer Space Treaty in the late 1970s. I, I joined that fight. It was my, my first activity in high school, but I understand you were a little bit more connected in the, uh, in the battle there. Uh, how did that all happen? Scott, you're muted. I, I come off mute, okay. Um, so Greg, thank you and good to see you. Um, and uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, virtual background behind me uh, for trivia buffs. Uh, you can tell that it's a, an Apollo era mission control by the existence of, um, of ashtrays uh, on, on, the, uh, on the disc. So uh, if anybody can see those, they notice it's not a modern mission control. Um, so I got interested in, uh, as in model rocketry, I think as many people did, uh, the movie uh, 2001, a Space Odyssey was very influential. So Arthur C. Clarke and Fred Ordway um, who was, who's also been involved with society. Uh, and of course, the part that I liked was, was not the psychedelic nonsense at the end, uh, but I, I love that vision of living and working in space, of people going to a space station that had businesses, that Pan Am Clippers uh, make phone calls and all that sort of thing. It was a very real sort of thing. And when you saw that uh, in the late 60s, you could believe that by 2001, that was certainly, certainly possible. And of course, like a lot of people, I was disappointed uh, when the Apollo program ended uh, because I said, hey, wait a minute, weren't we supposed to be going to the moon and doing all this stuff? And of course, I didn't appreciate then as I do now, uh, the political reasons why we do these things, not just what the technical reasons are. Uh, in college, I got to meet uh, Gerard O'Neill who uh, was uh, talking about his ideas about uh, space settlements and building them not on a planetary surface, but building them in free space. Uh, and uh, I was also, struck by the idea of people paying their own way uh, as opposed to simply a large government program. Now, the, as many people in this audience know, the Von Braun paradigm uh, is very strong, uh, still is very strong, uh, but O'Neill produced a different paradigm, which is a large numbers of people living and working in space, not just civil servants uh, and paying their own way somehow. 
And uh, that also was, I thought, very powerful. So that was great. Hey, this is really promising. I was working at the Jet Propulsion Lab in the summer. Uh, my first summer there was when Viking landed on Mars and there was champagne bottles and all the waste baskets. And this is great. I'm going to work here every summer. Um, and in, uh, it, but at the end of my senior year, uh, I guess when you were in, uh, in high school, so not too far behind, um, this, uh, this Moon Treaty thing came out and the L5 Society, which I had discovered through, uh, through O'Neill, uh, starting it and uh, Keith and Carolyn Henson out in Arizona, uh, put out this sort of alert. Uh, and I got a copy of the Moon Agreement and I read it and Article 11 still sticks in my mind. Uh, as really a model for a, a very socialist, very anti-L5 view of how the future ought to work. And I was kind of horrified. I said, oh, my God, this, this can't stand if we're going to do any of this. Um, and so uh, uh, I got involved in the campaign, you know, donated money and lobbied and so forth. And so my first exposure to uh, raising money to hire lobbyists to uh, go in and make sure this thing never got to the Senate um, was, uh, was very, very much, uh, you know, my, one of my first political experiences in space, if you will. Uh, I went to grad school and, um, the, uh, uh, at that time in the early eighties, uh, the shuttle had just started flying. The very first shuttle flight happened in 81 while I was still in grad school. A couple of my, uh, classmates from the MIT Aero Astro Department later went into the astronaut corps. Uh, there was a couple guys who came down uh, from Harvard, uh, who had been working on a study of materials processing in space. Um, and I distinctly remember the other uh, grad students in the space systems lab going, Scott, you, you like all that business and policy stuff. Why don't you talk to them? We, we really have other work to do. Um, and it turned out to be the founders of what became Orbital Sciences, uh, trying to you know, figure out what their direction was going to be. Um, so there was a uh, uh, there was a lot of things that 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 came together, and I think uh, when I left MIT because I needed to get a job to uh, pay off student loans, uh, I wound up in the shuttle orbiter division at Rockwell in uh, in Downey. Um, some of you may know um, uh, I know many of this audience know Rand Simberg, who actually uh, for a period of time was my supervisor, if you can imagine that in in the technical group, and uh, so it's a very small world. And uh, we worked in advanced engineering and uh, we worked on new ideas, the things we could do with the shuttle. We worked uh, space industrialization ideas, orbital maneuvering vehicles, satellite servicing. One of my particular things was uh, refueling uh, in space and fluid transfer and what that would, would involve. It became really clear that um, the issues of what we're gonna do in space are not gonna be driven just by technical issues, although that's foundational they're gonna be driven by policy choices. Uh, and therefore I decided to eventually go back to school and get a PhD in public policy at the Rand Corporation. This was just after Reagan had made the announcements about the strategic defense initiative and role of space. And so there was a very intense period uh, at that time. It was also intense for the space community for, because this was also the time when the old uh, National Space Institute, which was founded by von Braun, merged uh, with uh, the L5 Society. And, and you could not imagine two completely different cultural uh, organizations. One was a grassroots organization built bottom up, the L5. NSI was very much a, uh, a kind of a top-down organization. It had a lot of really uh, prominent supporters, had ties in with government, had corporate support and that sort of thing. Um, and, and yet we're both in the same general field. And so one of my introductions to policymaking uh, was working on the policy committee to try to craft a common position that both the L5 Society members and the National Space Institute members uh, could both buy into. Uh, now, it became that, that living and working in space that I know the society talks about today. That wasn't exactly a done deal uh, back then. And exactly how to do it was not a done deal. So while there was lots of work about how to merge the chapters and how not to lose that grassroots character, uh, there was a lot of discussions about finances and branding and imaging and all that kind of thing. Part of that discussion was also really what was the policy? What was this organization uh, going to be about? Um, so uh, anyway, after that, I, I went to Washington. I was at the Office of Space Commerce back in the early days and I've done a bunch of things. You know, Since then, I became 
you know, as they say, a Washington swamp creature uh, going in and out of, of government and, and think tanks and so forth uh, as I'm there in DC. Um, but I have to say that uh, some of the early experiences with the L5 Society and working in a non-government organization and trying to manage with no money, um, you know, was a very seminal period. Uh, we created uh, uh, Mark Hopkins, uh, created, uh, who's still, still around and active, uh, created the first political action committee. And so I had my first experience as giving money to politicians, which was an interesting experience. Uh, created the first lobbying organization, a 501c4. Uh, to formally have lobbyists and, and organize. Uh, so it was, uh, it was definitely a great training ground um, and also a way of taking some of the uh, visionary stuff and then trying to figure out, well, how do you translate that you know, into some you know, political or policy influence? You know, how do you even meet a congressman? How do you, and this is again, all before the internet. Uh, this is when our form of advanced communications was a telephone tree and one person calls somebody else and they call somebody else. And, you know, it was not the internet. Um, so a different time. And uh, in that period, uh, the ideas that we take for granted today about the importance of commercial space, the idea of buying commercially, um, these things which were initially somewhat fringe ideas, certainly fringe to the NASA of the day, uh, really have become mainstream policy over time, up taking a lot longer than anybody wanted or thought. Uh, much slower, um, but nonetheless a lot, uh, a lot stronger and deeper uh, than maybe uh, uh, we might have feared would be the case. So uh, generally you're getting to the right place, but taking a lot longer than anybody wanted. Let me just pause there and that's just a, just, just a thumbnail. Um, that moment in time, uh, one of the drivers behind uh, America's push in space from the beginning back to the Eisenhower administration and through that moment in time was, was the Cold War. When the Cold War ended, uh, how did that change the, uh, the dynamic and, and where did you see yourself in that, in that moment? Uh, that's interesting. Um, you know, I was there at RAND, which was pretty much the you know, center of uh, Cold War and we even trained Sovietologists. There was even careers in Sovietology, uh, not so much anymore, um, it's, it's different. Um, I think that the, 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 one of the primary thoughts I had was that a lot of the space activity was important to do regardless um, of, of the Cold War. It certainly produced a context for it, for a lot of military activity, but uh, the issue of expanding the economy, uh, the issue of developing new technologies, of providing a places uh, for America to go, I think was there regardless. Now, this wasn't independent of values. In fact, values were very important. I got into a number of arguments uh, wearing my policy committee hat and other hats uh, with people at the time in the 80s, uh, like sort of the Carl Sagan crowd, who wanted to you know, go to Mars with the Soviets. Um, I had a problem with that. One is I thought we should do building blocks and build an economy to get toward Mars, but that going to the moon first was important to develop resources and so forth. That was part of the kind of the O'Neillian paradigm. But the second problem I had uh, was going there with the Soviets. Um, and there's both a practical problem and a theoretical problem. The practical problem is that international relations come first and then cooperation in space comes second. We don't cooperate with somebody and then we discover we like them and then relationships improve. Space cooperation tends to be a lagging indicator. It comes after there are other political decisions. But the deeper problem uh, was, uh, and I kind of made it into a bit of a bumper sticker, which was, I don't want to see gulags on Mars. Uh, it's not enough simply to have our machines or even people in space. It's what values do they have? Uh, so one of the things that was great about working with Vice President Pence is, um, you know, early on we had a conversation. I had not met him before. I, I met him on Air Force Two and he's doing the final interview for the job. And uh, we we're talking about, uh, uh, you know, what the thought was where he wanted to go. And I said that it's not just our, our astronauts or our rockets we send into space, it's our values. And that I, if there is a, to be an American future in space, if there's to be any human future in space, I want it to be an American future. I want it to be a Western future. So that means things like rule of law, uh, respect for human rights, uh, free market economies, 
uh, all the things that we sort of take for granted uh, as we think is just commonsensical, there are gonna be other countries out there, other cultures who have other views, that's fine, they have a right to be there, but I don't want them there without us. So if there's gonna be a human future in space, I wanna make sure it reflects the values of the United States and the values of the West. And uh, I only had to say that once and he was like, yep, got it, right. That's, that's exactly right, that was, um, and so uh, uh, meshing that together, that it's, again, it's not just about technology, but it's about this larger picture of what are enduring national interests. Um, I served at NASA during uh, the Bush 43 administration, uh, a political appointee, so I termed out, you know, it says, that's a stamp, do not use after this date, um, and went off to university after that. And I was, of course, was uh, very much uh, bothered by the thrash that occurred over the 2010 NASA authorization bill and directions we were supposed to go on. And, you know, we, we got a very messy compromise out of all that. Um, and so I spent a lot of time thinking about how do you make this stuff sustainable across multiple Congresses, multiple administrations? Uh, because space is just really, in many ways, too delicate. It's a, it's a longer term activity. You can't you know, zigzag all over the place and expect to get anywhere. And one of the answers, I don't think it's the only answer, but the answer that I came up for myself was you have to tie space visions and directions with long-term national interests that are gonna be there regardless of party, regardless of what pres who's president, regardless of Congress. Uh, so military issues, security, economic issues, uh, human value issues, uh, being part of a larger globalized environment where many more people are going into space, being part of a more democratized environment where many more private sector entities are capable of going into space. So that if the space race was all about, look how cool I am, I can do this without anybody else's help. Leadership today is about getting other people to want to be in your parade. You have to give them on ramps, you have to give them ways to participate. And so that's why in Space Policy Directive 1, we talked about the importance, yes, going to the moon and Mars, which other people had said, but with, in this case, with commercial and international partners. Uh, that was the thing that was different, not profound, but very, very importantly different um, because we're talking about expanding the inclusion of people. And again, it's, yes, there's a von Braunian paradigm in there in terms of, you know, the stepwise approach of moon and Mars, but there's very much an O'Neillian aspect to it of expanding these private partnerships and expanding a larger international vision. And it's not just a bunch of you know, government civil servants leading the way maybe, but they're not the only ones who are gonna be out there. So to me, the end of the Cold War, to bring back full circle, was um, an opportunity yet again uh, to think about why are we doing this? Uh, I think we're doing this because we would like to see if humans have a future in space and if they have a future, we make sure it's one that's conducive uh, to values that we think are important. Right. Fantastic answer. And uh, I resonate with your concern about uh, what values we bring to space. I think that if you go back and you look at the age of exploration and you see which countries went out and, and did colonization, if you inherited the values of the Inquisition, your outcome was very different for the following centuries than if you inherited the, uh, the values of the Scottish Enlightenment. Uh, and the good thing, of course, is, is there are no indigenous people in, in our solar system to, uh, uh, to have their own cultures repressed. But this is a moment in time where we make some choices about how humanity is represented going forward and, and whether we build uh, gulags or whether we build uh, uh, open economies that, uh, that celebrate the individual. So right. great. Well, and that, and that I'll make the link back to the, to the start. That was the whole problem with you know the moon agreement you know there are parts of the moon agreement you could probably salvage for parts if you're a, a an astute space lawyer and it's not like all of it's bad okay but it has a fundamental has a fundamental flaw in it which is the idea that what we should do in space should be suborned uh to some larger uh, international organization that may or may not necessarily have our values there um and so uh, with that fundamental flaw in it, uh, it was going to be hostile to the L5 vision and what we do going forward uh, needs to be one that I think is tolerable or conducive to our values. And so it was, it was a worthwhile fight. Fantastic. Um, I'm now faced with the, the question of, as the 
first Bush administration uh, leaves in 92, um, the original uh, SEI, uh, Space Exploration mm -hmm. Initiative, uh, uh, ends up, of course, uh, getting canceled. Um, and then the second Bush administration comes in with a vision for space exploration to get us to the moon and Mars with a cre pretty credible uh, programmatic approach, but a, a traditional NASA, we're going to build these these items to mm -hmm. achieve specific goals and uh, mm -hmm. um, hardware tied to a programmatic uh, goals, goals and visions in a linear process. Uh, what happened there? Do you think that uh, the fact that neither of those programs really succeeded uh, in the long run uh, is a bad thing? Uh, or did we maybe, by going through the cycle we went through, end up with a, a better future? Um, I, think we, I, think we, I think we ended up with a more sustainable outcome. In, in the case of the, uh, the SEI program, I was uh, the Commerce Department representative to the Space Council at that time, chaired by Vice President Quayle. And, you know, the Space Council staff at the time and people in smaller agencies like mine uh, were very much interested in, and the science advisor uh, were very interested in having new ideas and different ideas, not just here's the NASA plan, but okay, what other possibilities are there? What else could be done? Because we knew there was a, there was a larger yeasty debate, sometimes uh, uh, promoted by far out organizations like the National Space Society, uh, that there was more than one way of doing things. Um, and we wanted to bring those to the table. And so, but there really wasn't any place to go to, where somebody else could generate, you know, technically credible piles of material. Uh, we went to the national labs. We went to Lawrence Livermore Lab, uh, Los Alamos and others. Department of Energy actually had a very strong uh, space office. Um, and they were able to bring different points of view today. Well, in this incarnation of Space Council, I didn't need to go to the national labs. I had tons of very credible alternative ideas and ways of doing things from industry. So the industry today is incredibly stronger than it was in the early 90s when we were searching around for you know, alternative concepts. Um, so I think that uh, by winding up in the situation we are today with a stronger commercial space industry, I, I think we have a much more robust basis for going forward. Um, in the case of um, uh, today, as an example of this, uh, uh, Chairwoman of the um, of the Science Committee, uh, uh, Congresswoman Johnson, uh, you know, wrote a letter uh, to the White House expressing concern about awarding the human lander system contracts uh, because uh, she felt that uh, you know really the government should own these things and this whole public-private partnership stuff. You know, she thinks is uh, maybe not a great deal. What we're going to pay these guys to develop something and then. We're going to pay them again to use it, you know. Where have we heard this before? Um, That's and, kind of like the trans railroad. What a, what a disaster that. Or 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 the COTS program, okay, which was, you know, uh, yeah, we paid them to develop this stuff, and then we pay it again to use it. Did we get value for money? Yes, we did. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I've had people come up to me and go, "Well, Scott, you know, you were a fan of the Constellation program." Yes, I am. Um, well, why don't you agree with Congresswoman Johnson? I go, different times. Um, in uh, today, I am very confident that private industry can build these things. They may take longer than maybe I want. I'm willing to sort of add some time to it. Um, but the days when NASA had some unique monopoly on technical skill to do these things, as it did in the 60s and even 70s, that's the day is gone. Okay, th th this, this expertise is out there in our industry. Um, and industry uh, can, is able to move faster and quicker and more efficiently. And if they don't, they die. So it, it edits itself out. Uh, and we get, and the taxpayer gets better value for the money. If there is an extreme case where maybe we're facing a monopoly or there's some sort of abuse, well, Government has march in rights in a variety of ways. It's exercised them for defense production in the past. Um, but the idea that we should do something, uh, another traditional approach, I don't think is warranted either by NASA's capabilities or what's out in industry. Uh, and in fact, this was a big debate, not a big debate. It was a fairly minor and quick debate uh, within uh, the last administration. Uh, one of the goals that, uh, that I and others had 
<clears throat> was to restore the NASA budget to roughly where it was at the end of the Cold War, which would be about $24, $25 billion um, in today's terms. And since the end of the Cold War, <clears throat> there was a long secular decline in the NASA budget over the 90s and then bopped along. Um, and we were not going to return to the Apollo era. We weren't going to be spending 1% of the GDP on, on space. But we should spend more. And we need to spend more if we're going to do exploration and break out beyond low Earth orbit. But we need to get value for our money uh, for that. So as part of the discussion about raising the NASA budget back up to where it had historically been, but again, not Apollo levels, um, the pushback was, well, are you going to do something new or innovative, or is it just going to be the same old thing? And I said, we've got programs of record. We support them. We're going to do them. But anything going forward, new stuff is going to be new and innovative. It's going to be public-private partnerships. Uh, it's going to be things like COTS. It's going to be things like commercial crew. It's going to be things like we're going to do a public-private partnership on the human lander system. And so now that we're building the first or have money for the first human lander system since Apollo, it is definitely not your father's Apollo you know, system. Will there be delays and problems in it? Yes, there will be. But part of the deal in the last administration was, you want more resources, that's great, but you got to show me you're going to be innovative and not just doing the same old thing. And I said, take it. I, I'll take that deal. And uh, that's what we're doing now. So uh, uh, I'll probably, uh, probably look forward at some point to kind of going back and forth with uh, the good chairwoman, who's a great space supporter in many ways, but I, I don't believe she's correct on this issue. And I would point out she's not the only one uh, on the Republican side. Kendra Horn took the uh, the same misguided position on, on that uh, particular issue, and uh, I had many conversations myself. But uh, as you noted, uh, both at NASA and as I noted, going back to the 19th century, there have been so many times where government stepped up and made something possible by funding R&D and then let the private industry turn it into business that not only solved the government's problem uh, and uh, created millions of jobs while they were at it. So I hope that's the future that we're looking at. Um, I, for one, uh, think that not only is commercial great because it might reduce our cost uh, and provide some innovation, but it's also important to have more than one vendor. And I think COTS really demonstrated that. And we've seen that with, with commercial crew because things don't always go exactly the way you want with each system. We had failures on both COTS. Uh, uh, launch vehicles, uh, but by having two, uh, we were able to take care of the problems that the space shuttle wasn't there to fix and that the, uh, the Russians were having problems with. If I'm on the moon, uh, I want system redundancy. So I want to see not just market competition, but I want there to be more than one way to get me off of the moon. Uh, otherwise, I think you can only send test pilots and, and brave heroes who, uh, who plan to, uh, to risk their lives in systems that, uh, that might fail. So. I, I, I applaud what was done with the human lander system in three very different choices. Um, what else is different about Artemis uh, than uh, what we saw in Constellation? Um, I think, uh, well, the, the human lander system is probably the, the biggest difference. Um, I think the other thing that you'll see uh, is there's certainly some more risks. Uh, there are more uh, people in the critical path. Uh, you know, the Europeans are providing the service module for Orion. Um, frankly, it's not as powerful as I would like, um, but you know this is part of that European contribution for it. Um, so it's not a the constellation system was kind of like a pure U.S. owned transportation capability uh, back and forth to the moon, um, and I think like the SEI program, um, the core was okay, but then you started losing focus as you say, well, what comes next? Um, one of the things that, uh, that, uh, that actually we discussed with both SEI and more deeply in Constellation uh, was a need for a lunar space station, something which now might look like a gateway. Um, and as we we're uh, working on uh, gateway, you know, my old boss, uh, uh, you know, Mike Griffin commented in public about he thought it was sort of a dumb idea. And I'm like, ah, thank you, Mike. Could you please just give me a phone call first? Um, and the, the, the reason you think it was a dumb idea was in terms of the sequencing, that you should design a way to get down and land on the moon first. And then as you start exploiting lunar resources, then you start having, you start creating fuel and a depot. 
and you store it there. So a reusable human lander really does benefit from having a gateway and so forth. And I said, okay, Mike, so what we're talking about is really the sequencing. You, you're, you're seeing something that's on page five and you're unhappy that I've got it on page one and I probably don't need it to be on page one. And he said, right, correct. I said, okay, you know, we never start with a blank piece of paper. We always start from wherever we are. We started with parts of the gateway and things from the asteroid uh, redirect mission and other ideas that were around. We weren't starting with a blank sheet of paper. And we were also starting with the need to be able to involve the Europeans uh, in this effort. And the Europeans were absolutely not sold at that point at going onto the moon, whereas they could see themselves as part of gateway and as part of continuing uh, the, um, the ISS partnership. So welcome, welcome to the issue of politics and engineering. You wind up going ahead and putting something a little bit sooner in your sequence than you ordinarily would do because it provides an on-ramp for key strategic partners. It also becomes useful later when you have a reusable system to where you can then store that fuel depot. Uh, do we need Gateway to go to the moon? No, we don't. Would we really like to have one when we have reusable systems? Yes, we do. Would we really like to have other international partners you know, at some point, not just by ourselves? Yes, we do. So you put those together and you, you come up with that approach. Uh, if, the, if you, Again, if you took a pure, pure engineering approach, you wouldn't do it that way. If you look at what's the art of the possible uh, to put that coalition together, to make it sustainable for a longer period of time, then you kind of, I think, you know, do what we did. Excellent. And one point I'd like to make, it's not necessarily the Europeans' fault that the uh, service module is underpowered. Uh, there was political pressure to save money by reusing components from the shuttle. And so just as SLS uses the RS-25s from the shuttle, which is a great short-term saver and a, a bit of a problem with the long-term uh -huh. problem. Service module uses the AJ-10 uh, shuttle orbiting maneuvering engines as opposed to the, the larger Apollo version of, of that same design. Uh, and if we'd known we were going back to the moon, that's probably not the choice we would have made. But I can say having been on the agency review team, GERS came out with the, uh, uh, the luminar orbital habitat and showed it to us. And we discussed gateway and, and you know the ability to, to get Orion to the gateway and the lander to the surface. And it's like, yeah, that makes sense. Makes sense to bring on the international partners to do it. We understand what Bob Zubrin's saying, and that's great too. Uh, I don't see one is conflicting with the other, and uh, I think it would provide some amazing. Go, I'm, yeah, I'm 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 not going back to the moon with an Apollo service module. I'm going back with an Ohms pod. You know, so <laughs> let's, you know, we can improve that. Hey, we have uh, we have a lot of uh, a lot of good uh, questions. You you, you want to pick uh, pick something off the Q and A? I do, absolutely. And one thing I do want to say, though, uh, is you mentioned international. I want to point out that Mike Gold is on the, is in the audience here. And I was wondering if you had any quick comments on Artemis Accords. Uh, and specifically, one of the questions we had is, uh, why is France and Germany not part of, uh, our, of the Artemis Accords at this time? And I'd love to know what your thoughts are. <laughs> um, I, think the, uh, I, th I think the short answer is that they're still working on what the role of Europe will have on the lunar surface. They're not, um, there's, there's a couple of different tensions in there. Uh, France feels, I think, fairly heavily committed, if not overcommitted, uh, to the uh, Ariane future and to uh, Gateway. And so if you added in uh, commitments uh, for the level of effort required to get a French astronaut to the surface, um, I, I just think they would have a hard time with it. So signing up for the Artemis Accords is not one of their really sort of near-term priorities, I think, from just a practical and a budget uh, standpoint, uh, because they would, if they came in, they would want to have a meaningful role. Uh, Germany is sort of the same thing, but they're a little bit different. Um, I've had more, over the years, more, uh, how should I say, support, it's not quite the right word, but more interest from Germany uh, in, in rewriting international space law in writing basically an update to the Outer Space Treaty or writing a more comprehensive structure. Um, I think that is really a misguided approach. Um, I think that we're better off building kind of bottom up with soft law and norms of behavior. Uh, but the Germans and to some extent the Russians have been very much interested in having kind of a larger, a legally binding structure. And 
I could imagine a legally binding structure that would be okay. I can also imagine a lot of structures that would not be okay. Uh, and again, you know, goes to the moon treaty coming back again. Uh, so I had some very interesting discussions with European legal scholars at, at the UN over the years, uh, where they were kind of stunned to find out that I had been an, an early opponent of the moon agreement because they think it all made perfect sense and was, was reasonable. And I seem like such a nice, normal guy. How could I possibly be against the moon agreement? I said, let me explain it to you. And then I was not such a nice, normal guy. Um, so uh, in, in some cases, it's a practical matter and just budget and timing. In other cases, there's a philosophical one of wanting to have more of a transnational, uh, legally binding treaty structure, more of a kind of a UN centric uh, kind of activity. Um, I just think that would take a long time. It wouldn't necessarily get you to a place that you want. Uh, I would welcome, obviously, them to be in the Artemis Accords. Frankly, let me say something I hope shouldn't be controversial. I would be, I'd be okay with China in the Artemis Accords. I don't expect to cooperate with them closely. I don't expect them to be on the space station. I wouldn't have them on critical path. But the terms of the Artemis Accord are very basic and very founded in international law and existing international law and agreements. And they basically are, hey, let's just kind of behave nicely and uh, not do anything dumb. And uh, I don't see any fundamental reason why they couldn't join without any, um, I think, compromise on their part or ours. Uh, doesn't mean, again, we're going to be traveling together soon. But uh, in terms of behavior in space, I don't see any reason why they couldn't be a member. Fantastic. There are several questions uh, around uh, your role uh, on the Space Council and uh, indirectly on the development of uh, policy and I assume the space policy directives. I'd like to hear a little bit about how that happened. And um, in particular, I think the elegant way that you took the basis of the Outer Space Treaty, which has some inconvenient limitations around sovereignty and private pro uh, property ownership and, 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 and crafted a, a very workable uh, set of rules, which then extend through to the Artemis Accord. Uh, sure. Well, one of the strategic choices uh, you make coming in, and not that too many people have done this, I was, I was executive secretary number four. Executive secretary number one uh, was Bill Anders of Apollo 8. And then during Bush 43, uh, excuse me, Bush 41, um, it was Mark Albrecht and Brian Daly, who were the, the two executive secretaries. So I'm number four. And every time there's an administration changeover, um, one of the choices is, do you start writing a new space policy or do you go deal with maybe near-term issues first? So I was involved uh, as a support contractor in the 90, 1996 uh, Clinton space policy. There were things in it I didn't like, but there are a lot of things in it that I thought made perfect sense. And uh, and continuity. Uh, when I complained about the things I didn't like, I was told, look, you can just change it when, when it's your administration, you can change it. And I go, yeah, yes, and I will. Um, and, uh, but a lot of it was basically okay. So when I uh, went to the White House in uh, Bush 43 at the Science and Technology Policy Office, and I was the space and aeronautics guy uh, before going to NASA with Sean O'Keefe, um, you know, we thought about well, what should we be doing on, on the policy? And one of them was, you know, the 96 policy is basically fine. Uh, let's go fix things that need to be fixed in transportation and GPS and remote sensing updates and things like that. But then we'll do a roll up of an, an updated policy, maybe at, toward the end of the first term. Well, they didn't make it. Uh, they wound up updating it in the second term in 2006, instead of being done in 2004, that's a whole nother story. Uh, but essentially is do the smaller things first that need to be urgent attention, then roll up the policy later. The Obama administration came in and said, you know, pretty much everything those Bush guys were doing was stupid and we need to start over. We need to go in a very different direction. Uh, and so they began very early on. I mean, on one hand, the shows are interested in space policy, at least at that point. Um, but they went in to do an end-to-end -end scrub of the space policy and, and update it and change it. And you know, certainly there's some areas they can improve on. So they came up with a 2010 policy, um, which again, has a lot of continuity in it. Uh, some things were phrased better, frankly, than, than in Bush, but there are other things that, that I didn't really like. And the, the policy though, overall, as with Clinton, was 
basically okay enough that you didn't need to trash it on the first day. So the one part of the Obama policy that I had the most difficulty with was the exploration section. It talked about journey to Mars. And that was provided, now nothing wrong with Mars as a goal. It, it's our goal too. But the problem is it was structured in such a way that was very old fashioned. It was very much a Von Braunian paradigm. It was, you know, we're gonna go to Mars, visionary goal, uh, work on it. We'll be there in the 2030s, maybe later. Nothing about commercial partnerships, nothing about internationals, nothing about steps in between, nothing about using local resources, nothing about economics. Um, and you know that I thought was just a flaw because you can't do major programs like that without tying them to larger national interests. So that was the first thing that I thought we needed to fix in the policy. And we did it without changing the rest. We just really just did a surgical change that became space policy directive one. The second issue was, well, we're not going to spend 1% of the GDP. We need to grow the economy more. So in line with the, the administration's general deregulatory efforts, we said, okay, Space Policy Directive 2 is streamlining launch regulations. We have reusable rockets now. Who knew? Uh, it's very different than having expendables. Uh, we need to be able to be more flexible in how we launch and license them. We have these growing mega constellations for remote sensing systems. The old regs are not keeping up. I helped write the old regs. I tell you that they were not keeping up. So uh, regulatory reform was the next big step. And then if we're successful and all these things are happening, uh, space truck management, that's a big problem. Okay, and orbital debris, all that. So space policy directive three was, okay, I need to get people together. What does the military do? What does the commercial side do? What does industry do? What does NASA do? Who play, what are all the roles and missions that people wanna have? Okay, that becomes number three. And then uh, the issue of military in space had been boiling along for decades. I have a basement full of boxes on Air Force in space and future of space and the military and all that. Um, and essentially there were about four different directions we could go in. One is to create a separate department of the Space Force. The other is to create a core like the Marine Corps inside the Navy. Third is to do something like the Missile Defense Agency, which is create a civilian agency that produces stuff that then goes to the combatant commands. And the fourth option was something like the Special Operations Command, so which has acquisition authorities. So you can imagine a space command that could buy things. Well, special ops people buy you know, really cool night vision devices. They don't buy billion dollar satellites. So the scale is a little off. In reviewing the range of these options and, and talking about security briefings and history and things that all went before. Basically, the president picked door number four. You know, we're going to, you know, do the Space Force. And then we made a course, he made a course correction, and, and he made it uh, to say, uh, we're going to start it inside of the uh, started inside of the Air Force as the Marine Corps is now inside of the Navy. It may not stay there. It may change in the future, but that's where we're going to start. So that became the basis of Space Policy Directive 4. Uh, which would outline the structure for a legislative proposal that Congress did pass on a bipartisan vote uh, that created the Space Force. Then we did cleanup operations with other smaller things that were important but aren't quite at that level. So space and cybersecurity, updating the GPS policy. Uh, we updated the rules on uh, how you launch nuclear power sources because uh, the old rules hadn't been updated since 1977. I mean. The presidential guidance on that was signed by Jimmy Carter. All right, so uh, we had learned some things since then. So we fixed that. So we then talked about nuclear power and propulsion in space. So it's really, it was a matter of just kind of like putting one foot in front of the other. And then we did a roll up at the end in 2020 of, and here's an updated national space policy, which by the way, you can see has strong, you know, genetic heritage going back to the Obama policy, to the Bush 43 policy, to earlier statements back, you know, Clinton and, and earlier. So there are things that are different and evolved, but there's also a long string of continuity, uh, again, which is important for, for the space business. Uh, so strategically, we made that choice very early on. Focus on things that urgently need to be fixed and then do a large roll up at the end, which is what we did. There are several questions in the chain about your working with other folks, uh, specifically about uh, Vice President Pence and, and Jim Bridenstine. I think it mm -hmm. was amazing to see the 
last four years is a moment in time where not only did you have a vice president that was thoroughly personally uh, uh, committed and engaged to space. You had a secretary of commerce who would go out and speak, uh, uh, you know, at space event and, and, yeah. and space geek. Uh, uh, and, and obviously, uh, Bridenstine really, I think, shared the Terrific. general vision. So can you talk about how that was? Yeah, it was, you know, um, I had, I, I left at the end of December and um, I, I later uh, came back and, you know, we had kind of like departure photos. So I, had a chance to, to talk with the boss one more time. Um, and, um, you know, I have to say, I cannot think of any vice president or really any senior leader who paid as much attention and made as much personal time uh, and was as engaged uh, as, as he was. There, there's historically no, no comparison toward it. Now, he had plenty of other things to do. It wasn't like I was able to run his schedule. I mean, I had to you know, kind of negotiate and, and, and get, get on the board, get on the agenda for other things. And of course, COVID took over really all of his time and a lot of 2020. Um, but he made time. It was something he wanted to do. He wanted to get out there and speak and draw attention to it. Uh, he just didn't want to see like little policy papers. He wanted to see events where he could engage with people. He was, he was never happier than when he could just, you know, kind of like a good politician could go out and meet people and talk with people. We went out to um, uh, out to uh, uh, Lockheed uh, in Denver. Uh, the guys in the bunny suits putting together the Mars Insight lander. You know, you see that, and uh, you see all the guys in the bunny suits. You know, giving thumbs up. You know, and uh, we we had him touring the GPS production facilities. Uh, you know, we went down for uh, for launches. Um, yeah, nothing that really. He found it, I think, very uplifting and a way to connect into something that was very unifying um, across. It wasn't a partisan issue. It was something that 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 unified people and people were proud of. Uh, it touched not just the the NASA and governmental side, but it touched, he was able to touch commercial and security and international engagements um, that normally you know you wouldn't. So I would say I had the best job on campus because you know who didn't like space? It was cool. Um, and uh, certainly, uh, it certainly had top level attention, which then made the rest of my life much easier. Um, you know, I, if I made a phone call, I got my phone calls returned. If I needed something done, like I needed a regulatory thing, you know, something sped up, you know, they, they knew that I was speaking on his behalf. So that was just terrific. Uh, and, and that all came from his personal engagement. He, in turn, was engaged by uh, the president's attitude. You know, and, and people would ask me somewhat, you know, skeptically, they would go, oh, really? Come on, Scott, how much did President Trump care about space? Really? Um, and I say, no, uh, President Trump's space policy is, is very, very simple, very simple. It's bigger, higher, farther, faster now. That's it. You know, <laughs> have you done it? Is it bigger, higher, farther, faster? Is it now? You know, he's in. Um, and that's kind of like a plutonium rod. I mean, that level of interest. I, I don't need to get into details of, you know, LOX methane, LOX hydrogen, okay? All I need is that interest that it's good for the country. Uh, it's good practically, it's good symbolically, it's good at multiple levels. Once he's got that, Vice President is completely on board, then starts implementing. So, he, of course, Vice President played a big role in, in uh, moving the Space Force along. He played a big role where we needed congressional help, played a big role in the NASA budgets. Uh, and DOD budgets. Um, and then, you know, you hire maybe a specialist like me for the, maybe some of the details, but I couldn't have done what I did without the vice president being personally engaged. So I really, I really enjoyed it. I, I thought he was a, I thought he was a great guy. I, I liked the team. Um, uh, there was lots of other stuff, of course, going on during the Trump years and people look at that and go, oh, my goodness, how can you work there? And I go, let me tell you where I was, it was great. Let me uh, redirect you back to NASA. So can you comment about your relationship with NASA, specifically Jim Bridenstein? And uh, as I noted, Mike Gold is on the call and the work he did on the Artemis Accords, I, I think was fantastic. Well, that, that, what Mike did was brilliant uh, on the Artemis Accord. And it, it was a kind of thing, what he and Jim, Jim conceptualized was very consistent with where I thought we needed to go in terms of building bottom-up stuff, but they made it real. I mean, they, they turned it from a, 
kind of a somewhat vague, you know, sort of idea that we all kind of talked about. And, and they, they, they turned it into reality, which was, which was terrific. Um, I kind of thought, uh, you know, my first reaction was, you know, Jim Brightside is a young congressman and wants to be administrator. Hmm, really, really? Uh, I changed my view uh, and became a really strong supporter of him uh, when I realized how serious he was about learning how to do this stuff right. And for me, the, the marker, everybody has their maybe personal pet peeves or things they notice. Um, and what he did, he wanted to understand Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty, you know, which deals with uh, nations are responsible for the activities of their persons in space. This was, uh, sorry to go down this rabbit hole, but this was actually a very important article because in the early days, the Soviets took the position that only states could be legitimate actors in space and that private sector entities were essentially pirates and had to be banned. That was disallowed. And we, the U.S. had ideas for commercial communication satellites. And we said, well, no, we're not going to do that. We will be responsible for anything our people do. Thank you very much. Step back. And so the compromise of Article 6 about uh, being responsible for activities of uh, entities subject to your jurisdiction control, and there's an authorizing and continuing supervision requirement that comes out of that. Well, that's very much part of uh, the whole idea for licensing and regulation in space. And so he had run across this, he had heard about it, and he went over to the State Department to go talk to the lawyers and other people to deeply understand it. I go, I've never seen a congressman you know, do that kind of homework because he generally cared about getting it right. And I go, oh, okay, this is different. Um, and then he became, uh, I think, just as great spokesman and channeler. He, had, he, he understood how organizations performed. Um, he understood what motivated uh, people. He understood the need to reach out. So his bipartisan outreach uh, also was, uh, was terrific. Um, I think in four years, uh, due to Jim, um, I was able to see Nancy Pelosi and Mike Pence tweet in support of the same subject on the same day. Okay, that just doesn't happen. Um, and, uh, and and Jim's kind of outreach made that happen. He, he certainly made you know Bill Nelson a believer, uh, who commented later. Um, but that kind of outreach is tremendously important. You know, there's that line from the right stuff about. What makes the rocket go up? Money makes the rocket go up. Funding makes it go up. What makes funding go up? Bipartisan support. And you've got to get that. It, that's the most precious thing in the world. Part of the reason why the whole 2010 thrash over the NASA authorization was so bitter and, 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 and destructive, it was because it was not a Republican versus Democrat thing. It was actually a, a Congress versus the White House thing. And you, you, you had this frame and pressure about the kind of stability and support you needed. So it wasn't just the substantive was going on, it was also you were, you were cutting, undercutting the political uh, agreement that had been put into place over the previous national authorization bills. And the members themselves know that bipartisan support is really precious and really hard to come by. And when you have it, you should do everything you can to keep it. So Jim understood that instinctively in his bones. He, he, he lived it and carried it out and uh, we were all better for it. Fantastic. When I was nominated for CFO last year, a friend of mine gave me a really nice plaque that he had made that said, no buck, no buck Rogers from, from the film. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to use it, but I shipped it to Steve Shen. So I hope it's on the CFO. <laughs> <laughs> That's right now. Um, we've had a, a, a question about the uh, regulatory environment. Somebody was questioning about whether the commercial companies are, are, are ahead of the regulatory framework. Uh, and as a member of the Comstack over at FAA, I, I have to say, I actually think our regulatory environment uh, is working very, very well overall, but uh, you know, nothing's perfect. What are your thoughts? Uh, I pretty much got everything I wanted in the remote sensing and launch things. And we did do some updating and export controls. Um, I think somebody once, you know, asked about uh, what were, you know, disappointments or failures or things that you, you didn't get, because not everything can be wonderful. Uh, and I have to say, probably my biggest disappointments have probably been uh, with the FCC. Uh, the FCC is an independent regulatory agency, doesn't answer to the president. Oh boy, does it not answer to the president. Um, and uh, they have a really, really important role in space, not only for frequency allocations for 
uh, for space systems in general, but how they license other systems that can interfere with or affect uh, space systems, uh, weather satellite systems, navigation systems, uh, rocket telemetry systems. Uh, they have a big role in orbital debris. Uh, the, if you go and get a license from the FCC for your satellite, part of that is a requirement for end of life disposal. You know, what are you gonna do with it? How are you gonna put it away? Now, on one hand, the FCC really has to be commended for forward leaning on things like the mega constellations. I mean, they, they could have thrown their hands up and said, oh, we're just not gonna do that. We don't understand them, whatever. No, they said, okay, you wanna make a run at it, go for it. Uh, so they, you know, they gave, uh, they gave uh, companies a runway to, uh, to do that. So I give them credit for that. I give them credit for not uh, coming down as hard a hammer as maybe some people would like on the orbital debris issue, but it is coming and you can, you can see the need to deal with it. Um, and I'm probably most unhappy uh, in areas where I don't think the FCC protected space services enough. I mean, it's, it's often a balancing act with other systems. Uh, 5G is incredibly important to the country. Yes, we need it. Yes, it's the next big thing. We need sufficient spectrum for it. Um, I think you can do it and still protect uh, space services. And we would have kind of fairly geeky arguments about what that protection means, but it, it would come down to issues of risk, you know, and who bears the risk uh, if, if we're wrong. Um, so, uh, so that's probably the area where I, I wish we could accomplish more. And it's the area we really had, had least control over, uh, independent regulatory agency. It's right there in the title. Um, and, uh, I don't know, uh, I don't know that that's terribly fixable or even desirable to be fixed, but the FCC is an incredibly important place that we don't really, most space people don't pay a lot of attention to. Uh, Office of Space Commerce. Um... The White House directed the Office of Space Commerce to uh, take the lead on uh, space situational awareness and space traffic management. Mm -hmm. Congress kind of drug their feet. Uh, the money didn't come as, as quick as it should. And it's the one area that I haven't seen the incoming administration here uh, yet address. Um, what are your thoughts there and what would you like to see happen? Sure. Uh, there's been some good uh, conversations, uh, I am told, uh, between the, the, the Hill and the new Secretary of Commerce. I mean, she gets it. She gets why it's important. Uh, the people who've been really supportive um, uh, actually have been the Space Force. I mean, General Raymond and his staff have just been absolutely clear uh, that they want to see this happen because they want to see commerce uh, and its open architecture uh, data repository be the place not only where uh, government data like from spacetrack.org can flow to, but also where there can be data from the commercial suppliers. So optical systems from ExoAnalytics, radar data from LEO Labs, uh, your space weather information you want to flow in there. They, they have the ability to do things that the Space Force just can get, but doesn't have the bandwidth literally to do it. The Space Force has got other threat issues to deal with, and they're not set up to be you know, a traffic cop. They're not set up as easily to partner with industry. Now, people go, well, commerce, what, what the heck do they know? Well, the answer is they have like some of the biggest cloud uh, uh, contracts because what do they do? They run the weather satellites. They do all, NIST does all the standards. They have a whole telecommunications service out there. They've got, a, you know, a um, the International Trade Administration reaches out and promotes uh, US businesses, you know, sort of worldwide. So commerce is a real kind of a strange miscellaneous organization. It's kind of got almost everything in it. And all of the pieces, uh, I think are all there. And I think it took a while for and a separate independent study um, for everybody to kind of realize, oh yeah, uh, the reason we put it there, okay, there's a logic to it. So now it's a matter of getting it funded. And uh, I think it, it really comes down to the, um, what the appropriators do. We have to see what's gonna be in the budget. Um, the quote skinny budget that's gonna come out, I don't know, next week. Um, will just be the top lines. You know, we may be into May before we see more budget details, which is sort of frustrating to the Hill because they, they want to see the budget sooner. They've got to, they've got to move bills. Um, but in terms of speaking for it, yeah, there hasn't been kind of public uh, statements about it at the level of Space Force and Artemis and Space Council. Uh, but I think it's on the radar. It's certainly on the radar of the, 
of the Commerce Department itself. It's on the radar of the Space Force people. Um, and we'll see uh, how much on the radar it is in the budget submission. Well, fantastic. This has been a lovely evening. I really appreciate you taking the time to join National Space Society. And uh, I'd like to give you five minutes to just uh, riff or comment on, on what you'd like to say uh, before we wrap up here. Um, I would say that uh, um, it's all the different organizations involved in space each play uh, their own roles. And I think if I look back over time, um, a lot of the really crazy ideas that came up in the L5 Society and National Space Society evolve over time. A lot of them are, are really crazy and okay, let's go forget them. Um, but if you look for where new and innovative ideas come from, um, they don't necessarily come from inside the industry or inside the bureaucracy or inside the normal organizations. Uh, they tend to come from outside. And it's like, I, I kind of liken it to being a you know, venture capital investor where you have to look at a thousand stupid proposals you know, before you find one that you, know, you want to go with. But that one doesn't come from the traditional places. It tends to come from the outside. So a lot of the innovative things you know, that we talk about today that don't seem so innovative, but suborbital tourism, tourist flights, uh, private platform space stations, lunar mining operations, all this stuff, it all began, you know, in the L5 society and the NSS and, and you know, frankly, among the space crazies, and uh, which I have an early low L5 society number, membership card. Um, and so it's, it's, it's kind of, it can be frustrating sometimes, I think, for people who do the stuff professionally, either politically or technically, and go, oh my goodness, another crazy idea. It's really important to have those crazy ideas out there because that's really where progress comes from. And so one should have a certain tolerance and in fact, a little bit of an eagerness uh, to make sure there's a place for those crazy ideas. In the past, we had to you know, uh, dig around a bit. Uh, now we have a much more uh, vibrant uh, you know, commercial and nonprofit space sector. Uh, so when the, the government looks for new and innovative ideas, it doesn't have to look far. Uh, we, we've got a lot of them. Some will not work, some of them will fail, some will be dumb. Uh, but the future is there with those. And other places don't have this. Europe doesn't have it. Japan's trying to cultivate it. Russia crushed a lot of their industries. China is thinking about new and innovative ideas and a commercial China as a commercial competitor, as well as a military competitor, uh, is also sort of the coming thing. But I don't think there's an L5 society in China yet. If there is, then I'd really start to worry. Well, fantastic, Scott. I wanna thank everybody who submitted questions. I apologize we didn't have time to get to all of them. I tried to, to summarize as best I, I could the ones that we did have. Uh, thank you so much, Scott. Uh, Bert, I am going to, uh, to hand it over to you and see if there's anything you'd like to, uh, to add to wrap up. Uh, and uh, I wanna wish everybody well in a, a, a future in space for for our nation and all humankind. Thank you so much, Greg, for moderating this evening. A great job. And Scott, I'd just like to thank you also for sharing all those insights. Who would have thought Nancy Pelosi and Mike Pence would agree on something on the same day? So it was just great to hear some of those, those stories and learn a lot more about how space policy is made. So we really appreciate uh, your your, actually all the work you've done for NSS and all you've done for our space program. So thank you so much. Uh, we did get a lot of questions and I, I saw a suggestion that uh, I've copied them all. I don't know if we can get some of them answered offline, but we'll certainly see what we can do about that, everybody. Uh, one thing about our audience, they ask such great questions. Uh, yeah, they're, they're yes. They're so that, we'll, we'll share that. I with could you. go for a few more hours. This kind of uh, like, yeah. I'm sure you could. <laughs> And they're so knowledgeable. So we'll see what we can do about getting some answered and, and uh, maybe get them on uh, our blog as well. So again, thanks, the, thanks to the audience for everything they've done. What I want to do is just close out now. And I'm going to share my screen again uh, with our typical final slide. And oh, those are the questions I have there. So uh, again, I just want to thank everybody for participating tonight. Always, I like to thank Larry Ahern, our Vice President of Chapters, for 
all his work to make sure we've got these space forums and town halls organized, uh, as well as uh, Fred Becker, again, our tech guy, and Dave Dressler uh, for all they do to support these and make sure they run smoothly. So uh, thank you guys for the great job. Again, one more thanks to Greg Autry for moderating and a special, special thank you to Scott Pace for uh, being our special guest tonight. So uh, everybody, I wanna thank you all for attending, wishing you uh, a great evening for those in other time zones, a great day ahead, and of course, a great weekend. And we look forward to seeing you in two weeks from tonight uh, with Michelle Hanlon and a great group of our lawyers uh, future lawyers, I should say, who will be talking about space law. So again, everybody, thank you so much, and we'll see you in two weeks. Hey, Scott.